So welcome everyone again. Well, we are very excited that we are starting the series again now. And well, I have a couple of announcements for uh, announcements first that you can check on our web page all the next speakers and the next abstracts as well as of each of the talks. You can see in the chat uh, the web page link where you can access to that. And at the same time, um, we would like to encourage you to present. Like, you can nominate yourself or nominate someone else to, to give a talk during this series or the next year. So um, you can use this form that's also in the chat for that. And at the same time, I also want to announce that uh, you can still continue uh, to um, offer uh, to a solanacy of the week. So it's to promote like your favorite species or genus and have some um, like, um, yes, like showing this species mostly in social media. So Rebecca is really good and she's in charge of that. And please, uh, you can also see, see the, the form, the link in the chat to, to access to that as well. So the other announcement is actually, well, as you, we already said before, um, now we have as organizer also Lucas Wheeler, who is here presented, and Matt Gibson. So thank you for helping us to organize. So we have like more ideas and bringing new people. And now, so I'm going to start like with the introduction of our speaker today. So if I'm not forgetting anything, no. So yes, and today we have the Dr. Remco Stam. Uh, he comes from the Netherlands. Uh, he studied biology and plant breeding in Wageningen. He worked on several projects in the field of molecular plant pathogen interactions before starting his PhD in that field at the University of Dundee, Scotland, and the Shane Hutton Institute. While working on his PhD, which focused on the molecular mechanisms used by the pathogen Phytophthora capsici to infect the tomato crop, he got drawn in the world of genetic diversity and genomics. And intrigued by the immense variation in the molecular place in the plant and the pathogen, he decided that he wanted to understand how such diversity evolves in natural plant populations. In 2015, he got awarded by the prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship to start his work on the evolution of resistance genes in wild tomato at the population genetic groups of the Technical University of Munich. And finally, since 2017, he's a research group leader at the Chair of Phytopathology at the Technical University in Munich. His group now works on the interface between, interface between molecular biology, population genomics, phenotyping, and file biology. And today he will give an update about the work that he has done to help understand the diversity and evolution of biotic stress responses in the species Solanum chilense. So thank you, Renko, and now you can share your screen. Thank you, Rothia, for, for this introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's a great honor to, uh, to be here. Um, let's see if I can get this to full screen. There we go. That should work. Yes, perfect. You see my screen nicely, full screen. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, I'm um, going to present my work on differences in biotic stress responses in diverse populations of, of Solanum chilense. Um, and yeah, it might be a bit different topic than some of you in this series have presented because as you said, um, I'm trained as a molecular biologist and I really rolled into this field of, of um, diversity by accident, basically, um, but I, I fell in love with it, and I really want to now see if I can combine my knowledge of whether I can work with the knowledge from, from molecular biology and model systems and see if we can try to figure out what happens um, yeah, in nature and how what kind of um, effects this has. Um, and I would like to also start with a slide um, that, that we constructed for a, a recent um, current opinion paper. Um, just illustrating that there is basically a lot of mismatch between, yeah, or, or gaps in our knowledge. So on the left, we try to illustrate that we know, for example, that if you have all these different crops, like this is the Arabidopsis, this is supposed to be red tree, tomato, whatnot. We know very well that all of these plant species have very different genetic composition, also when it comes to their resistance properties. So they have very specific resistor gene families, 
Um, and, and we know that there are tremendous differences, but once we start to look on a population level within one species, we have absolutely no idea. Um, this is only studied a little bit in Arabidopsis with, with the rise of the 1001 genomes. And there's some other small exceptions, but there's really not so much known. And this is where I really want, want to take this work. And to do this, you of course need a model system. And since I've always loved working with uh, solanaceous species, I did my PhD on um, tomato, cultivated tomato. I did master projects also on um, potato. So we start with Solanum. Um, and today I'll introduce my work on Solanum chilense, which is a wild tomato species from um, Chile and Peru. And I'll try to introduce three different aspects of my work, basically showing how we can use a species like Solanum chilense with a very specific geographical structure and very specific diversity patterns to really understand different ev um, evolution and diversity on different levels. So we want to understand the evolution of classical resistance genes that are also called MLRs. I want to take you onto a little journey in how a pathogen is actually recognized by a plant and whether there is variation in this process. And then the last bit of the talk, I'll also show you um, how quantitative variation in defense responses might play very important roles in these species. But first, um, I would like to introduce Solanum chilense itself. Uh, those of you who have seen um, a talk by, for example, Boris Igic in this series, or Gustavo Silva, who's also here today, will know this already. Um, but I guess a little reminder does not uh, does not help, but uh, does not hurt. So Solanum chilense is is um, one of the southernmost Solanum uh, wild tomato species. Um, we can roughly divide the habitat in four main habitat regions. Um, the most um, the largest one is this central region on the border between Peru and Chile. Um, people already assumed that this is likely the center of origin of the species. And from this area, um, populations migrated south in an island track where they stay at quite high altitudes or on the southern coast where they live at very low altitudes. These two are separated by the Atacama Desert. And some ice, uh, populations must have migrated back up north because we also find the species there especially the northern populations, but also some in the central region, somehow overlap in their range with um, Solana Peruvianum. Um, this is especially in the north, a reason why we're not really sure how to deal with this, uh, with, the, with the species. And you'll see that sometimes we just ignore the north in our analysis because it's a bit more complicated there. Um, just to illustrate, the southern highland is, is, and because these regions look really different, which means that the Tomatoes themselves must have adapted to a very different climate, but also the co-abiding pathogens must have adapted to different climates. And this is why I think it's so interesting. So we have these highland regions where you can really see um, there are deep gorges. And in these gorges at this moment, of course, it was bone dry when I was there to take a picture, but there's water running every now and again. Um, on the coast, you don't have really, you don't really have these gorges. You have this, this more yeah, barren landscape where um, you get your humidity in the air because there is a sea fog that rolls in. Um, very regularly, um, parts of the year, almost every morning, there is a very dense fog. On the densest days, you actually, when you drive your car there, for example, you need to drive with your windscreen wipers on because the fog is so dense. So there is a lot of humidity. And this humidity, of course, creates what we hypothesized, at least, a very conductive environment also for pathogens. Because a pathogen, in order to be able to infect a plant, needs humidity. It needs a humid environment, at least most of them do. So. Then we have this other region, the central region, and this one is much greener than the other two. Um, so again, we think in, in this area, the plants must encounter loads of different pathogens. Um, this region ranges from, from almost sea level all the way up to three and a half thousand meters. The picture on the right, you can see um, in the back, these terraces, and on these terraces, the locals grow potatoes. So you could kind of imagine that this is really not a typical desert climate as we saw in the others. So, this gives us the perfect model system, so to say, to study both of our adaptation and then co-adaptation to the pathogen. Um, and together with, um, with Gustavo, who I already mentioned before, when I was in the lab of population genomics, um, we try to infer the demography because if you want to study evolution of specific defense-rated processes or pathogen defense-rated processes, you first need to be absolutely sure about the evolution of your, your organism in general. Right? 
And I'm not going into the details of, of these graphs because Gustavo already explained them. So we can also watch his presentation. It's online as far as I know. Um, we used genome data from three individuals representing the three different um, geographical regions, the center, the coastal region, and the um, highland region in the south. Um, and we use the software MSMC to basically try to identify when these populations must have split. Um, and what is the most important thing from this, uh, this slide to take home is that the populations split at different times um, and have also different expected population sizes and different fluctuations. So what we can say, for example, um, we can summarize this in a graph like this. The central region we assume is the center of origin and then the coastal the populations on the coast, they split earlier and had a more severe bottleneck than the populations um, in the Southern Highland region. Um, and this is important because once you have this kind of information, you can, like I said, start to really understand what happens to your species as a whole. And therefore you can also start to answer questions like, do pathogen resistance genes, so very specific evolutionary patterns in natural uh, populations. So, are they under stronger selection pressure than the species as a whole? Or is adaptation to a pathogen actually the driving force for the whole species or the other way around? Is it a side effect, et cetera? These are the kind of questions that we wanted to answer. Um, and to do this, I developed a system um, that other people have also used. So we're going to, we wanted to sequence all the resistance genes in these plants together with a set of control genes. Now at that time, this is a couple of years ago, we did not have the budget to sequence whole genomes. We still really don't have much budget to sequence whole genomes because it is quite costly. So we enriched the um, R genes, we call NLR genes, one specific family using a specific kit where you basically tag your DNA with specific probes and you only pull out the genes of interest. So a lot of people do this um, in many different contexts. We made a, a sample set where we only sequence like 250 or so NLR genes or resistance genes, as you'd like to call them, and a set of control genes, like genes that were selected based on, on other people's works, for example, Tanksley, that, that have been used before to infer phylogeny and also to show um, neutral demographic patterns. So then we sequenced a lot of plants in pools, <coughs> mapped it to the reference, um, did QC, SNP calling and filtering and everything. And then you can calculate all your evolutionary parameters. So just to show you, we sequenced pools for plants. So we, we obtained seeds from, um, from the TGRC in Davis and for all the populations, all the populations are colored here. These are where we obtained the seeds and we sequenced at least 10 plants per population. Then we can calculate, um, yeah, typical population genomics parameters, right? So nucleotide diversity in different measures and all these others. And we can then use this, and I say we, but this is in fact work that um, Gustavo did when we were in, um, in population genomics, um, where we make an ABC model to really try to um, assess how the different populations interact and how they're related to each other. And again, Gustavo presented this in his talk as well. So I'll very much only touch um, some of the basics. So what we could show after, after running this um, is basically that we are able to roughly simulate um, certain parameters. And we tested a lot of different parameters, like, like I said, nucleotide diversity, um, but also, and this is the one that was most important, um, a statistic that we call FST, it's probably known to a lot of you, which is basically uh, the fixation index and it gives you an indication on how um, populations are, are um, diversifying, basically. So how much, how much diversity there is between two populations. And what is important to take from this one slide, it's very colorful, but what we can see is mainly that um, our models before we correct them are all over the place, but then um, the red one seems to really come close to this black dot, which is, is the actual um, data points that we want. And on the right, um, you can actually see um, the um, observed data, because we have a data set that we could actually use to train, because we had these control genes and we had our R genes in our data set. So you can basically see, uh, this is color coded, so you can see that the observed data very well um, correlates with the actual simulations that we did on the FST between these populations. So once you know this, so once you know that we can nicely simulate the FST between the different populations, and these are the mean values, um, we can also 
run these simulations again, and we can start to think of, okay, what are values for fixation that you would expect if your populations are evolving? You know, they're migrating and therefore they are evolving. So that's, that's what I'm trying to show here. So what we have here, just three graphs, basically. Um, and these three graphs, they illustrate, for example, three different pairwise comparisons between populations. So I think for all of you, um, it's quite intuitive to, to know, like if you have two populations that are close together, there will be variation. There will definitely be genetic variation between them, but it will not be that much. So this is what we simulate in the left part of the graph. So there is, for example, if we take two of the blue populations, you simulate the diversity, you simulate the FST, and then you get a range of FST values because what we want to do is we assume we have 30,000 genes on a genome. And for each of these genes, we want to know what could be the potential FST if we simulate this, right? If, if we, because what we in the end want to know is whether our genes are more or less diverse than the, the value that you expect to get when you only have this demographic pattern, right? So whenever there is two populations that are separated from each other, they will be to a certain extent diverse. And that's exactly what we see. So when we simulate on the left, we simulate two populations that are close to, close to each other, you see that our FST values range from close to zero to say 0.5. If we simulate two different populations, say one red one here and a blue one, we see that this FST simulation goes up a bit, right? So the median goes up, it goes to 0.25. And the most extreme value, so some of the genes on this genome might have an FST of 0.5. And this is just because the populations grow the way they grow, right? They are separated this much just based on the underlying data. And then on the right, you see um, if we take a more extreme case, so two populations are really far away, this could be like a, a, a purple and a green dot, you see that this FST value goes up even more. And this, this is extremely useful because only when you have this kind of simulations, you can start to say, okay, now I want to look at specific genes and I want to know if they experience more diversification or a higher FST than this simulated range. So I could imagine a scenario where we see something like this, right? So here I plotted three extra genes. These are, for example, my resistance genes and I, I can calculate the FST and then I can compare it with the simulations that I did. And this is, this is a hypothetical scenario. So in my hypothetical scenario on the left, I have three genes, a red one, a golden one, and a um, black one. And all three are showing an FST value that is higher than what we would expect. And with this, I would argue, okay, there might be something happening to these genes. They are so much diversified between the two populations that there must be a stronger balancing or positive selection acting on these genes. Um, in, my, in my middle example, this doesn't seem to be the case. Only two out of three are outside my simulation. Um, and in my right example, only one of them is outside the simulation, but actually it's not one of the three I mentioned before, it's a green one. So it's, it's a four gene suddenly. And this is exactly what we did. So we have this possibility to calculate for all our resistance genes, the FST values, because well, we sequence them. And we have, based on our ABC models, we can simulate the expected range and they get something like this. So this is again, a snapshot because when you have 14 populations, you get 91 pairwise comparisons. And here I only show five, but what you can see on the left of each, of each pair of, of uh, um, data points, we see the real data. And on the right, we see a simulation. So, and it is like I said, so if you have two populations that are, for example, in the Southern mountain region, the FST ranges in a certain range, but it's a lower range that you expect than when you have them in the other region or between the regions. Um, and what is immediately striking is that in all the simulations that we have, and we just simulated all the values for, for a genome with 30,000 genes, in all the simulations, in all the cases that we have, some of the R genes have a higher FST value than the, the absolute maximum of our simulation. So we think this is a very strong case that some of these RGs might indeed under positive or balancing selection. Well, as I also showed in my example before, we, it might be the case that in the one population, it's one gene that is outside the simulation, but in the other comparison, it might be another gene that is outside of this range that you simulate. 
So we need to summarize these data in a way. Um, and that should be popping up now, but it doesn't. Ah, there it is. So here I showed some of the genes that we have in our data set. So each, um, each stack bar is, is one resistance gene. And you can see, and this is just the number of occurrences that they're outside or simulated range. And what you can see here is that some of them occur only once or twice, which is interesting because that means that between these two populations, the alleles for this specific gene are different. But it's also a bit, yeah, you know, what, what does it really mean? Whereas for others, like the ones in the middle here, this one or that one, you can see that it pops up 60 out of 91 uh, um, comparisons that we made. And this is, of course, very interesting. I can show this in a different way. Maybe that helps. So here, um, this is, for example, so one of these genes on the left that is only different or outside the simulation between two different populations. Um, but the ones on the right, they pop up in these comparisons between many different populations. And we think that it's only those that are really essential for the species to really adapt to a new habitat or new pathogens that are arriving. Um, and you can see also, I, point, I plotted arrows because you have a, a PC that is higher or lower. So you can actually start to estimate the direction of the fixation that's happening. And we see for this gene in the middle, for example, that all the arrows point towards the north. So something must have happened or must still be happening in these northern regions for this one gene to be different there. Whereas the one on the right, you see the arrows all point down. So there must be something in the southern coastal region for the genes to be adapting there. So then we can summarize this. So we had these 250 genes, about 150 we could properly analyze with our data because we had some issues with the quality. This is a bit of a problem when you work with complicated resistance genes. Um, and then you get a graph like this. So if you count all the outliers between all the populations, we see that if we just look at the groups, we see that there are roughly 30 out of the 150 genes that we analyzed that are at least once or multiple times different between populations. So I thought that was, that was quite interesting that that already shows that resistance genes are extremely important, but they are not evolving all over the place, so to say. So only a relatively small subset shows these signatures for selection. Um, and then if you say, yeah, but now we want to be really sure and we want to know that if genes are different, they need to be different, not between one population in the coast and one on the, in the, in the central region, but at least between more than half of the populations from the center with more than half of the populations from the coast, because we want to look at more generic patterns. And then you get a graph like this. So it's very low numbers of resistance genes that are actually showing this consistent pattern of um, increased FST outside the range, like four to the southern coast, four to the southern highlands, and eight back up north. So it's very, very low numbers. Um, but that's also very interesting, because that really shows to me that for a plant to adapt when you migrate into a new area, you don't need to change all your resistance genes, you just need to change a few, which also makes sense. Um, and the next question that you might have, have is like, what kind of resistance genes are involved in this? Uh, because there's a lot known from molecular biology and resistance genes sometimes work alone, sometimes they work in pairs. Um, and we wanted to just know, can we learn a little bit more? And I think the main take home messages that we know that some of these resistance genes, they're called sensors. So we know that they directly interact with pathogen molecules and some of them, we call them helpers. They signal together with the sensors, but they cannot work on their own. And interestingly, um, what we see in the data is that these habitat adaptation genes are more often the helpers and not so often the sensors. So to me, that seems that there must be something in the, in the R gene signaling itself that is very important to change and not the sensing that is important to change. So I think with, with this experiment and with this setup, we, we learn really a lot. So we, we really start to understand how our genes differentiate between populations. And we know that it's less, but there is a large variation, but it's less than, than some people would have hypothesized originally. Um, we can also really differentiate between the kind of evolution pattern that we see. So local or major habitat adaptation can be clearly differentiated. Um, and for the molecular biology perspective, I think it's very interesting to see that these helpers also need to change because the, the hypothesis initially was these helpers need to be extremely conserved because they need to interact with so many sensors. But now we actually see that the helpers also change 
when Solanum chilense migrated into the Atacama or to the edge of the Atacama. So this is very important. It's also very important to know, for example, when you want to continue with breeding for resistances in Solanum say, because it might be that you find a sensor that needs an adaptive helper. So maybe you need to clone or integrate two genes at once rather than one. So, and we, we really like to follow this up and really like to study how these resistance genes function and how this now has a measurable effect, but we can't because we don't really know which pathogens are recognized by which of these NLRs. So this is a complete dead end at this moment. We first need to really sample a lot of pathogens and really start to make links between our genes and pathogens before we can follow this up. Um, but we found another way because I'm, I'm intrinsically interested to see what you can get on a phenotypic level as well. So how do these Solanum chilense populations respond to different pathogens? So we switched a bit, we cheated a bit, so to say, um, because we just switched to a different system where a, li a little bit more is known. So to answer the question, how do, pop do populations of Solanum chilense respond differently to known pathogens? Um, we use a system of cladosporium or now, um, how is it called now? It's called different, but Cladosporium fulvum is, is um, the species that, um, that we used. And we know this is a pathogen on tomato. And what we also know is it's a so-called biotrophic pathogen. So it needs to grow in the plant when the plant is still alive. And to defend itself against the pathogen, it recognizes the certain secreted molecules that we call effectors. The moment these molecules are recognized, the plant kills a few of its own cells. Therefore, the pathogen cannot feed off the cells anymore and it cannot grow. And you can actually see this under a microscope. So this is in the middle of a fully infected tomato leaf where you can really see the, the mold on the leaves. And when we stain and do a microscopy imaging, we can see the, the high fault threads all over the tomato. This is a resistant tomato line that has one specific resistance gene that recognizes one specific molecule of cladosporum fulvum. And you don't see any of these high threats anymore. Instead, you see very small dots that are basically dying plant cells that prevent that the pathogen can enter. And we know this happens in cultivated tomato. Um, and we were very pleased to see that we can also see this in our Salan Chilense. So we have some plants where we see the exact same kind of phenotype as when we have a fully resistant um, cultivated tomato. And we have some Salan Chilense plants where you can really, you can see it here by eye already, there is some some uh, growth here of the pathogen. And you can really see also the high fault threads growing in a microscopy image. So this made us think, okay, so now we can actually test how these plants respond to this pathogen. And, and we can use the system to also see whether in the geographical context, there is variation in how these plants respond. Um, so I, I said this already. So how this works is these tomato plants, they recognize one specific molecule and they do this with one specific receptor. And if this happens, you get this cell death. Um, and we can force this cell death because we can purify this one specific molecule. In this case, we call it AVR9. And when you infiltrate it in the plant with a syringe, like purely with a syringe, you put it in the plant, you can even see the mark of the syringe on this leaf. After infiltration, the plant will think the pathogen is growing there. So it will start killing its own cells. And then you see this really nice and brown necrotic lesion, which is a proof that the defense response is working. So what we did is we tested the populations for their responses. Uh, we took a slightly different sample set as we did in the previous study. We took a few more populations as well. Um, and we took up to 40 plants for populations of all the populations that you see on the map. Um, and we basically infiltrated them in three ways. So we infiltrated them with one specific pathogen molecule that's called AVR9. We infiltrated one with a related molecule that is called AVR4. And we infiltrated them with a full mixture of all the possible um, yeah, antivirulent molecules that the pathogen can secrete by basically extracting um, apoplastic fluid from a fully infected tomato plant. And of course, we also infect some water because sometimes a plant is a bit oversensitive and it, it might give some necrosis. So, what do you get when you do this? Well, you get some really, really cool results. Um, so when we infiltrate this complete mixture, some plants don't show any response at all. So that means that the plants completely lost the ability to recognize anything related to Cladosporium fulvum. So it cannot recognize any effector. And this is exactly what you see in the South. The whole Southern range has lost the ability to recognize this pathogen. Whereas in the north and in the center, 
there is always a certain percentage of plants that is able to recognize this mixture. And I think this, this already is, is fascinating that at some point there is a, a switch and suddenly the plant loses the ability to recognize. And this might, of course, be climate related because the moment we go further south, it really does get drier. I mean, these, these plants, they grow happily, but you've seen the pictures, it is very dry. And Cladosporum fulvum does need some humidity to start to be able to infect. So maybe this is one of the reasons. Um, but we didn't stop there because this is, this is intriguing, but we also wanted to know a little bit more. Like I said, we know these other molecules. So we know this AVR9 and AVR4, and they're very well studied in molecular plant pathology fields. So since, since the early 1990s, people have been working on these. Um, so we really wanted to know what happens to them because in the literature on cultivated tomato, people say you can either recognize AVR9 or AVR4 because the receptors are allelic. But what we find in Salam chilense is that that is not the case. So we find some plants that can recognize both. So all the ones that are yellow in our graph. Um, we also find that some populations, um, there are no plants that just recognize AVR4, and in some populations there are no plants that are just recognizing AVR9. So it's actually much more complicated than we first thought when we opened the older textbooks and the older literature that really said there is either a AVR4 recognition, AVR9 recognition, or a recognition of neither. Um, and we try to get a bit deeper to this by doing some PCR, but it's very complicated because we don't have sequence data for these complete genes. So we designed primers to very specifically amplify the regions that should allow you to differentiate. So here I, I made a very rough schematic. We have two different allelic variants of CF9 and one of CF4. So recognizing variants of AVR4 and AVR9. And we just tested whether all these regions were present in all our populations again. Um, and then you get graphs like this. So we show that the CF9 fraction that people have always thought this is the causal part of the gene to recognize AVR9. In, in our hands, it turns out to be present in all the populations. Um, and CF4 turns out to be present in some of the populations and in none of the scenarios, it nicely correlates with whether the plant is resistant or not. So this is, this is another really cool example that if, if you work with a wild system like this, that you're going to find a lot of new things. So we, we did this for all our populations and it just, it just doesn't make sense. That you, cannot, you cannot really make sense out of this from the knowledge that we have from the textbook. So this must mean that there must be different allelic variants of these resistance genes that are present in the different populations, or even that the recognition of this pathogen or these molecules works in a different way. So again, there is really a lot to explore in, in this system as well, but we have some very, um, very important conclusions. Again, first of all, Cladosporum fulvum is recognized in Salam Chilense. So it shows really that what people found in this lab setting and really focused on, on glass house infections is actually relevant in these natural populations because we see this variation, we see these differences, but we also immediately learn that it's not really typical. So there is definitely more that we need to do to, to get to the bottom of this. We would really need to sequence all the genes with much higher resolution than what we were able to do so far. Um, and another really cool thing that we found is that there is this complete loss of resistance in the southern populations. Um, and we also would really like to understand how this is possible because I can understand that one of your receptors is, is broken down or you lose it because there is no purifying selection on your receptor anymore because your pathogen is gone, but that you lose the whole mechanism. Also the, the underlying signaling pathways that, that are involved, that is quite striking to me. So this is something that I would like to follow up in the future as well. But so with that, I covered two topics that I introduced in the beginning. Um, and, and the third one, I think, is even more intriguing and, and is, is going to get us closer, even closer to, to what we've seen in the field, because in the end, we want to understand really what happens in situ, what happens over there in Chile, in Peru, with these plants. So the next question that we ask ourselves is, do we see quantitative variation in the defense responses um, between these plants? Because when we're out in the field, you don't see one completely destroyed plant and one perfectly healthy plant. You see one plant that has a few infected leaves, the other one that has like a few more infected leaves and the third one that has many infected leaves. Um, but there's, it's definitely more a quantitative difference than a black and white difference as, as we would expect from, from this Gladysporium um, studies. So 
to, to get a bit of an insight in, in how this could work, um, I chose to just do infections with certain pathogens. And I worked with Phytophthora during my PhD. So I thought, okay, we take a random Phytophthora infestants, we put it on all these plants. This is um, work by um, a PhD student, student Pavinder Kalom, who actually also did the previous projects, very prolific student. Um, and here he did thousands and thousands of individual infections to really see how often is Phytophthora able to infect a plant of a certain population and how often is it not. So again, we took the leaves from, we grow all these plants in our glass houses. So we have 150 plants constantly maintained in the glass house. They're perennial and we can go back, pick some leaves, do an infection experiment with it, or we can infiltrate them or we can, we can do whatever. And it's, it's a really nice system for that reason as well. So what you see here is that Phytophthora infestus is actually almost always able to infect these tomatoes. But the percentage of success that the spores have really varies. So here again on the top, we have, I, I selected one specific population, 1963, we have 10 plants. And you see that on average, there's one plant here, it's only infected half of the time. And the other plant here also like 50% of the time, Phytophthora successfully infects. Um, and 50% it does not. Whereas if we go to this other population, 4330, um, here at the bottom of the graph, you see that Phytophthora infest is almost always able to infect. Like the infection success rate is much close to 80% or 85% even. So there really seems to be a quantitative difference. And not just between the populations, but also within the population. Because this is why Pravinda did so many repetitions. We really infected every plant over and over and over again to really see how much of, of our readout is variation in the way we do the assay or randomness because the spore just randomly does or does not germinate and how much can we link back to a genotype. And it really, it's, it's really solid. We can do this, this kind of experiments again and we'll get the same output. We will always see that this uh, 4107 plant is infected roughly 25% of the time and the other times it cannot defend itself against Phytophthora. So, and the growth rates also differ. So it's really, really interesting to see um, because the neighboring plant from the same seed batch or the same location is, is, is much more susceptible, for example. So this, is, this was really cool. Um, then we wanted to make sure that this is a generic pattern and not just cause because we happened to use a Phytophthora infestus that was collected um, in Ecuador. Um, so we wanted to know, is this, is this really universal or is this um, Phytophthora infestus strain related? Um, and to cut a long story short, it is not Phytophthora infestus strain related. Here, we did this again for all the different plants. We took a lot of random Phytophthora infestus isolates. P100 comes from Argentina. Uh, this one comes from France. EC1 comes from Ecuador. Like I said, there is one from the Netherlands. There is one from uh, the one that originates from potato, the other one that originates from tomato. And what we see is that, for example, this plant 10 is almost always, whoops, almost always 50% infected, whereas this plant 11 is almost hardly infected. And we have this data for many more plants. So we can now say that this kind of defense mechanism that is there is kind of a universal defense mechanism. This is not an adaptive mechanism. This is just there. This is in these plants, and they can defend them against the different Phytophthora isolates to a certain level. So now we wanted to know, OK, so knowing that there is this variation, what is causing this? Uh, this, this brings us to a much more molecular level in the study. Oh, I see that this didn't line out very well. There we go. So to, to really measure this, we wanted to say, okay, we measure, we infect these plants or we treat them in this case with a cell wall component because to work with a live pathogen, it's quite tricky. So instead of doing this, we say, okay, we take the main component of the Phytophthora cell wall and we treat the plant with this. And then we measure whether there is a defense response. And if you read the plant pathology literature, you will, you will very quickly see that several of the phytohormones are, of course, extremely important, like salicylic acid, ethylene, um, and also some other aspects are very important. So we teamed up with a food chemistry department here that have very good equipment to measure all these hormones. We took all the populations that I showed before, so 14 of them, and we measured salicylic acid, ethylene, desmonic acid, ABA, all the hormones that you can think of in all the plants after treating them with this, with this um, laminar and this cell wall component. And what we see is, of course, what we expected. So we see a lot of variation in these responses. So some plants 
show hardly any salicylic acid response at all. Like, and some populations don't show anything. Um, some plants show a high ethylene response, whereas in the same population, some plants do not. So yeah, really like we expected because we saw such a high variation in the infection phenotype as well. Um, and we measured other things. So we also measured, for example, the creation of reactive oxygen species, which is also thought to be a major component in starting the defense signaling. So here again, a summary. We, we took all our populations, again, nicely color coded. Each line is a different plant summarized over multiple experiments. And you see that some plants give this very high defense response and some plants really don't give it. So that's great, right? Because then we said, okay, so now we have all these components and we can start to make a model and we can maybe say, well, the plants need a high ethylene response and then they're more resistant or they need to have a high salicylic acid response and then they're more resistant or rosburst, for example, because the literature would have suggested rosp and salicylic acid if you read some of the more classical um, Arabidopsis literature. So we took all these data and we took all the data from our infection phenotypes that, that, we, that we published before and we tried to build general linearized models <coughs> and we just played with them to really see what is your best fit here. What, what are the models that mass match? So we started very simple, right? So we take our infection phenotype, which you call Y, and then we see whether Ross explains this very well. And those of you who are familiar with, um, with uh, GOMs, uh, basically the lower your um, ARC or your BIC, so your information criteria, the lower this number, the better your model fits. Um, and we use GLMs because then we also can correct for the batch effect because we could not test all the plants at the same time. You might imagine that 150 plants cannot be measured in one day. So we did this over several weeks. This will give a little bit of variation. So we need to correct for all these effects. This is why we try to make these, uh, these GLMs. And, and the most interesting thing that we saw is from, from all the main hormones, ethylene was the strongest or the best in explaining the defense response. Um, but when you then start to, to make it more complicated, you can say, okay, well, we can also make a model where you say your infection phenotype Y is not just the effect of ethylene responses, but also the creation of these reactive oxygen species, maybe abscisic acid, um, salicylic acid, and all these other things, because it's a complex defense. So we expect many of these components to be involved. Um, and what we figured out is basically that the model is not as complex as we expected. So we expected for salicylic acid to have a very large role because this is what you, what you read in, in a lot of um, plant pathology literature. Um, but basically what we found, of course, we need a complex model, but salicylic acid seems to be a very small role at all. So it's ethylene, the creation of some um, um, reactive oxygen species and the basal levels that are already present in the plant before we start the experiment of abscisic acid and uh, phasic acid. So this, this is really exciting. Um, and we wanted, because we saw that this ethylene seems to have a very big effect, um, we wanted to look a little bit deeper into this. Um, and this is where we want to, want to take our work in the next stages as well. So overall, ethylene has a very strong effect in the defense with, um, response against phytophthora in this case. But if we split our data for the different populations, we see that this is definitely not always the case. So here I have two graphs showing the ethylene response on the one axis against the infection frequency on the other axis. And if you look at the left graph, you can see that in this one population, there seems to be almost perfect correlation, right? If you have a very high ethylene response, um, you have a very low infection frequency. And if you have a very low ethylene response, the plant is very susceptible, very highly infected. Whereas in the right graph, yeah, there is nothing like this. So there is absolutely no correlation between how resistant the plant is um, and, how, um, and, and how much ethylene it produces when, when the plant gets infected. Um, but that, this really is true for this one population we can actually show because we can go in the lab and we can inhibit ethylene production just with a chemical inhibitor. And then you can really see that if we remove the ethylene production from these plants, this is on the right side, ET inhib, you see that the infection frequency goes up. Um, and in both cases, it goes up to a similar level. So a very resistant plant already gets much more susceptible. A slightly resistant plant gets a little bit more susceptible. So we can really show this ethylene really is important. Um, and it only plays a role in some of the populations. And I think this is very exciting. This is also something that we would like to now 
continue to follow up. So summary number three, there is very clear intraspecific variation in these resistance phenotypes. Um, these are universal, at least against Phytophthora. Um, and we also see that underlying this, there is a lot of variation in these, let's say, canonical defense responses. So the generation of uh, upregulation of hormones or the creation of reactive oxygen species. From our models, we know that it's not just one component that is responsible for resistance, but definitely a combination of two, but not necessarily everything that we could measure. So we really, if we put everything that we measured in our models, they didn't get better. Um, and what is very exciting as well is that ethylene seems to have a very strong role, mainly in these coastal populations. And this makes us yeah, think a bit because ethylene is also known to have a, a physiological role in salt stress signaling. So maybe because these coastal populations needed to adapt to a new climate, they, but that involves already ethylene responses in the salt stress signaling, this signaling molecule itself took over um, also the responses against the pathogen. Um, but it's not that simple. Like if, if you look in the literature, this is a, a graph that I stole from a paper from, from Cornel Peters and his lab that was published like 12 years ago now. You can see that all these different phytohormones are very much interacting, right? So salicylic, jasmonic, ethylene, everything has complex pathways and at each stage in the pathway, there is some kind of interaction between the, all of them. So yeah, this is, this is where we are. Um, and, and it really means to me that we really need to start moving away from just looking at what is happening on the plant just on the phenotype or what is happening just with one receptor, one molecule, but really need to start looking into these more complex networks to really understand what happens when a plant in the field is trying to defend itself against the pathogen. So that's what I try to illustrate with, with panel C. Um, but it doesn't end there because as I showed, there is so much variation already within one population, within one accession, that we really need to immediately try to find a way to do this in a population context. So this is what we try to illustrate in panel B. Like we really, we cannot just say we take one plant and we try to study this because what you find in one plant from one geographic location might not even be true for the neighboring plant. So this makes things very complicated, but also extremely exciting. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the next few years of research where we really, really want to dive into this. Um, and, and we want to do this. Um, I, I have a little bit more time, I think. I, can, I, I thought I could talk about 45 minutes and then it would be time for questions. So I want to give a quick preview also. This, I know the pathogens are not Solanum, but uh, you might like this as well. So because we also want to know what about the pathogen? So we went, we went there, we went to Peru, we went to Chile, uh, we tried to collect um, in 2018 and 2019. Um, and we visited about 400 uh, different, uh, no, we collected about 400 different samples um, from all these different tomatoes in all the different regions, the main regions that I described. So the coast, the highlands, and the central region. Um, and what we found is that um, certain Alternaria species seem to be the dominant pathogens and they have very nice and clearly quantitative phenotypes. So of course, this was a little bit disappointing for me initially because yeah, having done my PhD on Phytophthora, I was really hoping to find a lot of Phytophthora there so that we can immediately take these results and link them back to what we found already in the lab. Um, but we could, we saw Phytophthora, but we didn't see it that often and that common, but we really saw Atenaria. And here's just a few examples of these very small lesions. But here you see in the background, there is one leaf that is completely destroyed. So there's definitely quantitative differences between them. And so we're now really also trying to figure out what are these pathogens, which ones are the most common, which ones are kind of representative for the pathogens on the local populations. And then we're going to revisit the work that I presented before with the defense responses and really see if we can do this in an even more realistic context. Um, and maybe we need to look even further because we also collected some, some leaf microbiome samples. So we, we washed the leaves to try to collect all the different microbes on there. Um, and to our surprise, we didn't find all the things that we expected. So we, we again barely found Phytophthora, but we did find it in these reeds. We also found a lot of Alternaria in this. And what is really nice as well, and I actually didn't expect it to find it, but we also find a lot of Cladosporium. Um, so it's, it is also on the leaves and also in the populations in the south. So, so our results do make sense somehow, but we still need to, need to work to the next steps to really blend everything together. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I'm close to the end of my talk. So I think 
I have convinced you that Solanum chilense is, is a great system, not just from a botanical point of view, but also really from a plant pathologist point of view, because you have this really nice geographic and climatic adaptation, geographical pattern and climatic adaptations. And we, we, we're now really starting to see that there is this variation in the pathogen defense on many different levels. Um, in the lab, we can, we can really work with it nicely. And next, I really would like to, to take it a step forward. So really start to incorporate the pathogens from the field and maybe also do experiments in a more realistic field setting. Um, at the same time, we would like to dive deeper into Solanum chilense genomics um, because there is a lot that we haven't touched on. So we are now sequencing um, about up to 100 plants from all the different populations to move beyond this diversity in just our genes, but really look at other genes that are involved so that we can really also confirm our hypothesis that there must be some selective pressure, for example, on the ethylene signaling in, in the southern coastal populations. And when we have this kind of data, we can also really start to look in, in the, the interaction between the different climates and the different pathogens and what came first and what poses a stronger pressure when Solanum chilense migrated from the center to the highlands or to the coast. So with this, um, I'm at the end of my presentation and there are insane amounts of people that need to be thanked for this because this is so much work, we cannot do this alone. So all my colleagues at uh, TU Phytopathology, so Ralph Hukolo is the head of our department, Parvinder, Lina, Tamara, Leo, Michael, Andrea, Mindy, Babna, Corin, and Regina did all of this work, um, especially all the infections and all the, the hormone analysis. We have partners at the sequencing center of the TU, um, Gustavo for his modeling in the beginnings. Hormone measurements were done by our colleagues at Food Chemistry. Um, genome resources were um, put together with help from people in the Helmholtz Center in Munich. Um, our colleagues in the Senckenberg Institute are working on the pathogen diversity aspect. And one extremely big thank you also to um, my colleagues in Peru and in Chile, because with, without them, I would not be able to visit these populations to sense how it is to how these plants really work and to really continue the work to integrate also um, Altenaria um, in this research. Um, and last but not least, I need to thank also Eric, um, Paul, and Mathieu for their contributions in some of these projects. So with that, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, I thank you very much for your attention and I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Remco. That was a great talk. And yes, uh, like now we are open to questions. So remember that you can just drop like your question in the chat or or you can just say that you have a question. And first you have, we have Federico Roda, who has a question. Uh, yes, hi, uh, very nice talk. Thank you so much. I, I have a, a couple of questions. So the first one is, uh, some of these uh, wild uh, relatives of tomato and potato are, are thought to have a promise for the introgression of, of traits that have been lost during domestication, and uh, especially pest resistance and uh, abiotic, abiotic resistance. So do you think, so based on your results, which show that the genetics are complex and, and the responses vary within species and within populations, do you think, what is your interpretation in terms of being able to use these plants to introgress traits uh, to, put, to tomato or to potato or to crops? That's, that's a very good question. I, I mean, there are these traits, right? But it, it might not be as easy to find them. Um, so if, if you take 100 Salam Chilense and you would screen them just randomly to look for a resist, the most resistant plants, we're going to find this, right? I showed you that there is at least one plant in our set is, is very often resistant against Phytophthora. So there must be something in this plant that we can find. Um, it's just not a universal resistance that is present in all our Solanum chilenses. But you can still use this one specific plant for, for your breeding purposes, for example. So I, I think there is definitely a, a, an enormous richness of, of, of properties in these plants that probably have gotten lost um, during domestication. Because, yeah, it's hard to say which plants we use to start the domestication with, definitely not these chilenses. So 
Yeah, I, th I think there is a lot of scope, but you need a different approach from what I'm doing. You need to be a more classical breeder and you need to put much more brute force in it. You might want to screen a thousand Solanum chilense to find one or two with good resistance properties against your one pathogen of choice or good properties against salt stress or something like this. Okay, great. And, and the other, yeah, the other question is about the thing that I work in and it's, do you know anything about the importance of not so much our genes, but secondary metabolites or defensive compounds for creating resistance to these uh, pathogens or for variation in resistance across, mm -hmm. yes, across, so, across populations. So this, this like the usual actually, suspects, steroidal like alkaloids or acyl, yeah, acyl sugars yeah. or these things, yeah. So this is actually something that we are also working or trying to work on at the moment. So um, one of the, my PhD students, Lina, she is now finishing the analysis of, of, let's say, the first trial experiments where we take cultivated tomato and we've treated it with these kind of cell wall components, in this case, chitin, and we treated it with a very aggressive Atenaria atenata strain that, that, I, that we found in our data set and the one that cannot infect the tomato. And then we measure untargeted all the secondary metabolites and we do see certain groups of metabolites that are specifically upregulated only in the resistance uh, with incompatible interaction, so to say, and some that are um, upregulated all the time. So we're, we're trying to look into this. We're establishing the methods and we hope to then over the course of the next year make, make the move so that we can also measure this in Solanum chilense. But it's going to be very challenging. But there's definitely secondary metabolites involved in in resistances against the different pathogens. Yeah. Which okay, ones thank I you cannot so say yet. So it's, it's untargeted data. We start to be, we're starting to annotate some of the compounds at the moment. So we don't, we don't know which ones yet, um, but we're, we're, we're looking for the usual suspects initially and we'll see what comes out. But yeah. Within half a year, I hope to have a preprint on this online, but maybe you have some suggestions. Maybe we can, we can discuss this in more detail as well. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Federico and Renko, for questions and answers. And now we have a question from Ellen Tai. Uh, she said, great talk. And do you think that beneficial endophytes play a role in geographical variation? Yes. <laughs> I mean, this, I think all of, all of these things are going to play a role. And, and the trick is to really yeah, get down to it, right? I mean, it, it is well known that when you have certain endophytes in your leaves, they change the metabolism of your plant a little bit. So especially in this system of, of Atenaria solani, where we really see this, these tiny variations sometimes. Sometimes lesions are small in one plant, say five, six millimeters, and in a neighboring plant, they're seven, eight. This looks very consistent. It might have nothing to do with the plant's genetics. That's actually true. It might be that there is an endophyte in the one plant and not in the other, or that there is something beneficial in the soil. Um, and that is not in the soil a few hundred meters further. So this, this is something that, that is constantly in the back of my mind. The problem is you cannot study everything at once, right? You need, you need huge teams to get deeper into all of this. But yeah, so this, this is why we, we started this, um, this microbiome project. Um, but there again, money is a limiting factor. So we only took epiphytes and we couldn't do endophytes. You should just, yeah, you need a lot of money to sequence everything everywhere. So. Um, but there, there will be there will be something underlying this. It's it's a complex net. So yeah. Great, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has a question. Jesus, thanks. I do have a question about um, because I don't know if I miss it. Like if, when are you measuring like the the like the hormones? Um, the, the hormone level after the phytophora infection, because I will expect like to have a very rapid response in, uh, in, in reactivated oxygen species, and then later having this hormone, like the increase in ethylene, for example. Yeah, yeah I, I did not say this, but the, the reactive oxygen species are measured within the first hour or 90 minutes, I think we took in the end because we saw that the response was a bit slower than, for example, Narabidopsis. Um, the hormones are measured after three hours and after 24 hours. So we, we measure them later because we know the processes are a bit slower. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, I would love to measure this over a time course, but yeah, you know, with 150 plants, 
we need to select one or two time points and just see what's out there. So this, it might be that what we're measuring is either a bit too early or a bit too late. This is, this is true. This is something that we know. Um, there are always limitations to the system, I guess. So would you, would you suggest a specific time point for, for certain defense hormone measures or? Well, usually I remember when it was working a different model a long time ago and it was in soybean and usually I was measuring the reactive, reactive oxygen species at 30 minutes. It was kind of the peak. Yeah. And then hormones, I was doing some studies across time. I can't remember very well, but I think it was between four and six hours, the peak of hormones. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's where we sit. So we measured three and six hours, I think, with a tube PCR on the tube plants to see when the main regulators are um, activated at least and then we took the the samples a few hours after this so right. we we think we're we're doing well but yeah there might be some delays you know this is it's the interesting thing of a completely wild species you, it might not really translate how you measure this in, in cultivated tomato or you know soybean or evidence so yeah yeah well thank you thank yeah, you. yeah. Um, well there is comments of course of, thank you excellent talk and so here we have a question from Pat Bedinger. I don't know if you want to turn on your microphone or I can do it for you. I think she was. Yeah. Sure, thanks. Um, so, so Chalency is of course self-incompatible and that complicates things, right? Because you're showing so much individual yeah. variation. Do you, have to do you have to keep propagating something vegetatively to preserve a particular phenotype or how, how does that affect your studies? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it affects our studies in such a way that we have, uh, we have a huge glass house where all these plants are indeed vegetatively propagated. I mean, they're oh, okay. values, right? So, so yeah. we, we have them, I think three, four, five years and then you start to see that they lose a bit of vigor. So then we propagate them vegetatively. And we maintain them so we have excellent glasshouse staff. I, sh I should have put them on the on the acknowledgement site. So, <laughs> yeah, so they so cut important. them back every two weeks, right? So that when they become bushy, like the one behind me, they cut the main leaves off, and then we have a clean stem, and they start to grow again. So we always have leaves that are roughly the same age, and the only thing that really changes is that the stem starts to to lignify because they turn woody. Um, and then after three or four years or two years, they change the soil to make sure that there is enough nutrients. And then two years later, we, we replace the plant. Um, one, one big issue, maybe not the proudest moment of our lives here, is that uh, <laughs> a year ago, we detected tomato mosaic virus in all our plants. Oh, that happens to everybody and at some point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so we are now maintaining, because that's the populations that I use for this study. For everything that I presented, they're now maintained in their own little quarantine glass house where you need to really suit up and all these things. Because we, we went back over time and we see that this virus infection, it's latent. It's there, but the plants don't die. They don't wilt. They don't yellow, nothing. Yeah. It doesn't seem to affect our, our experiments. So we're maintaining them in quarantine. But now in parallel, we have to sow a new batch because you cannot make clean, you cannot rescue an infected uh, Taranchi lens plant. Even with, with tissue culture, we tried, it's always infected. There's always virus in there. So, so there, this is an intrinsic risk, but I think we've maintained the plants now, yeah, eight years quite well. And now we have a new batch, so stay, same seed batch, but then different, different individuals. Um, and we'll make backups now. And I, preserve them differently. So yeah. I, I still think it's one of the better systems to have um, be, because the, 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 the fact that it's outcrossing makes that there is this exciting variation. So yeah, it's a trade-off, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Um, well, I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, so, Thank you very much, Remco. That was a great talk. And uh, next week, this is a very important announcement. We are meeting on Thursday instead of Friday. We are going to send an email anyway to remind you, but uh, it's going to be the same time, but on Thursday. And Yana Kazakova, she's going to present continuum defense responses of solanaceae uh, to pathogens. Uh, and her talk is going to be about the bittersweet symphony. Characterization of Gorky, the novel sterile 
glycoalkaloid transporter. So see you everyone next week. And thank you for coming today. Bye. Bye all, thanks for coming.